like even being asked, what do you do? And I think the easiest way to answer that is I'm a father. But uh, <clears throat> there's something I discovered a few years ago, which is the power of photography. Uh, and photography, not just for its own sake, but photography in terms of what it can do to tell stories, to impact people, to impact society, to impact nature, and ultimately to impact our destiny. So I want to do two things uh, now. The first one is to tell your story. Like I said, um, this is about storytelling. And then the next one will be introduced in due course. A few months ago, about a year and a half ago, uh, I was in the Amboseli. So I drove into the Amboseli. Actually, one of the pictures there, the one on the mountain, if you go close to it, you'll see it's much clearer. That was when um, we were down there. This was December of 2022. And I want to tell you a story. I wrote it down um, very, uh, actually on my way back to Nairobi. Um, and I think it resonates for a lot of us who have the memory of what happened just a few months ago. So the Amboseli is empty and silent. It is not the comfortable emptiness and silence of a lazy savanna afternoon when the big cats are resting away from the heat of a December summer and their prey has a few hours of respite from the depredations of hungry predators. There are few raptors gliding and soaring on the thermals overhead, looking for an unattended feast, a kill to feast on. No. The Amboseli is empty and silent because of the carnage that is evident at ground level. The stench of death is everywhere. It is sometimes faint, carried only on the wisps of wind, and the dust devils are dance on the dusty dry earth. But sometimes that stench is thick and unmistakable, especially when you get close to the carcasses lying here, lying there, lying everywhere. There is wildlife everywhere you look, except that that term is a cruelly misleading one, because the wild animals are all dead. There are wildebeest as far as the eye can see, but they are lying on their side, the life long gone, and only their desiccated bodies left. They are joined by the carcasses of zebras and antelopes and other victims of the long, cruel, and ending drought. There are also reports of elephants, felled not by greedy poachers, but by an environment that can no longer support them. They lie where they fall. Their magnificent tasks bearing witness to a long life now suffocated out of these wondrous giants. They have been out at droughts before, the rains have failed before, and the herds have died before. But this one seems to be worse. It's not only covering a wider area, but it also comes after back to back to back to back to back failed rainy seasons. Normally, the heaviest rains are supposed to take place between March and May. And in school, we had to learn of the fact that uh, we had to call them the long rains. But these long rains have not been seen in their proper quantities for at least five seasons. The elders say that they have never seen anything like this. Lest you doubt what you may assume to be their clouded memories, the scientists also give their own version of their own wisdoms. They say that they have started collecting, they started collecting reliable data in the turn of the 1950s, and it has never been this bad. That is three quarters of a century's worth of data, confirming what the eye can see and what the nose can smell and what the eyes or the ears fail to hear. There are rumors that it has rained in the Chulus, many miles and many days of walking away. The rumors are carried not only through human mouths and into human ears. The animals at Amboseli have their ways. They can sense and smell the temporary bounty of the Chulus, which is why they all head that way and leave the safety of the Amboseli to their deceased fellows. The surviving elephants head for those hills, as do the zebras and the antelopes and the wildebeest that can make the trek. They hope to gather where there is rain and grass to be had, if only to try and make it until the rains are strong and steady enough that they may return to a resuscitated Amboseli. But others have heard of the rain in the Chulus, and they also head for the hills so that they and their herds may survive. The rumors in this case are relayed by mobile phone, but the trek is just as long and as arduous as that of the silent ones. 
So they heard for the Chulus as well, that the cows and goats and sheep that survive may have refreshed sustenance. But of course, all these herds, both wild and domestic, are heading for the same limited pasture. In years gone past, they may have managed to do so in some semblance of tense harmony, with each species finding some space in which to graze. But now, desperation colors every interaction. Since the Chulus are just about the only grazing area holding an entire ecosystem together, there is more tension than harmony. My friend Saruni is an affable, ever-smiling man. When Sam and I tease him that he has never so much as invited us to his home and slaughtered a goat for us, he promises us next time he will do it. Lakini wewe ukija Nairobi hatuwezi kosa kukuchinjia. Hata kama tutaendea mbuzi sokoni, we tell him. He takes a challenge and promises us that we will have ribs from his flock, unlike us who have to buy the goat for slaughter from the market. Later, we take a game drive. This is the same game drive that is so silent and so odoriferous. We are lucky to come across a family of cheetah which are busy with a late afternoon dinner that they have just felt. Pilipili, our driver, tells us that the kills are easier now, with the prey being so emaciated. But during the game drive, Saruni is on his phone constantly, trying to arrange veterinary care for his herds in the Falawi Chulus. His herdsmen have also sought solace there, and the reports of a dying bull lend gravity to Saruni's ever more urgent phone calls. We challenge him. Has this never-ending drought changed the thinking of our Maasai people? Have the dead herds perhaps put pause to the centuries of accumulation of cows as wealth and status symbol? Saruni is genuinely torn. He speaks hopefully of perhaps maintaining a smaller herd, perhaps stocking up with a crossbreed between the Sahiwal and the domestic herds of the Maasai. But he needs to maintain precious bloodlines. He knows that if he walks into the watering hole, owning a herd of a mere 20 or 50 beasts, he will be unwelcome at the table of the real men who own 300. The endless lands of the Maasai are also changing, where vast group ranches meant that animals could move from one area to the other, following pasture as it became available, these have now been divided. City people, you and I, in their big 4x4s are now showing up with a hunger for small plots that are being sold off as the group ranches are subdivided. And city people do what city people will do. They put up fences and post guards to keep away intruders from their property. The fences now mean that the age-old movement of cattle and wildlife is now squeezed into an ever tighter funnel. The Maasai can see this. There are those who are able to and will look at this subdivision as cans and are making an effort to marry the old ways with the new demands and the new hungers. They try to ensure that the herding grounds are maintained and that the wildlife still has an adequate dispersal area even as the pressure from the city people becomes ever harder to resist. Saruni's dilemma is a shared one, but one that he and others who are equally discerning hope to resolve successfully. We drive back to Nairobi. The carnage is all around us. Through the plains of Imbirikani and Selenge and Mashuru, into Isinya and Kajiado and Ololaitikosh, and almost in into Enomatas Yani and Gong, the dead herds and the cell smell of putrefaction follow us. Here and there, herdsmen and farmers have tried to burn the carcasses, perhaps to prevent death and disease, perhaps in a fallen attempt to give dignity to these dead beasts, perhaps in an advertent sacrifice so that the rain may return. That was December of 2022. If you think back, um, those very few months ago, this is literally two Christmases ago, two New Years ago, things were bad. Speak to anyone who was in these lands and you'll be told stories of broken people. We have had some relief because of what's happened uh, in the last year. We had good rains. Uh, the long rains at last came. Uh, El Nino uh, did a bit more. But you notice that now we are at the end of March uh, and we are sitting in a tent in the open. The rains have not come yet. So the stories that you hear, the people you speak to about ecosystems, about conservation, about people and places, 
are real people. And this is what they went through. So I thought that story um, that was from a few months ago, and it's a real story. Sarun is a real person. I can introduce you to him. Mm. Um, is actually emblematic of what it means when we manage an ecosystem well mm. and when we manage an ecosystem badly.